Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another edition of Gate 7 International. I will be your host for tonight, Costas Llanos, or Costas with a K, if that turns you on. And I am joined by, drumroll please, absolutely no one. That's right, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, it's just you and moi for the whole ride tonight to discuss everything, uh, to, to discuss all things Olympiacos. Uh, please do, do let me know if you uh, if you can't hear me right. I see Aris Galamatis talking about technical difficulties. Um, well, I do have this weird uh, weird microphone. Please do let me know if you can't hear me or whatever. Uh, so, guys, I mean, before we get uh, we get things going, uh, obviously, uh, if you haven't done so already, if you're new to the channel, we have a lot of uh, regulars in here, obviously. If you haven't done so already, please do like and subscribe. It really helps the uh, the algorithm. Really helps uh, to share the um, to, to, to share the word. Uh, a lot of Olympiacos fans uh, around the uh, around the globe. We keep meeting them every day. Uh, so please do like and subscribe if you haven't done done so already. Of course, share to uh, to make the channel grow, and of course, support us on Patreon. You guys, uh, our Patreon keeps. Uh, Keeps growing. Uh, we're having um, we're, we're having a lot of cool conversations on WhatsApp and a lot of exclusive content coming your way through Patreon from other, a lot of our exclusive interviews. And there's soon going to be some merchandise, guys. So do watch that space. I see comments coming in already. Uh, here we got Chris Seat. Hello, Costa. Good win today. Hi, Chris. Thank you for joining us at this hour. Uh, indeed, that was a great, great victory uh, today. Uh, the technical difficulties that Aris Galamatis mentioned. Uh, Hussein, Guzel, thank you so much for joining us again, Hussein. We needed the win, the winning feeling tonight. I know we have a lot of work on, but let's celebrate the victory tonight. I could not agree with you more there, Hussein. We're going to go through everything together. We're going to go through a lot together but first guys um i would like to take this moment uh to um I, I would like to kick things off it's very it's it's very unfamiliar it's uh, it, it's not something we do at gate seven international uh, we never talk about ike and Panathinaikos in that capacity but i would like to kick things off with a moment silence for ike and Panathinaikos, both of whom were did not make it uh, out of the europa league so a moment silence, please. Nah, I'm just kidding. We're not doing that. We're going through. Uh, we're we're, we're going to go and talk about the uh, the big win tonight, which was of course against Batska Topola, like uh, a five two win at Karaiskaki. What can you say really about this result? Um, in the Patreon group, which if you haven't done so already, please join us. It's on. Uh, You'll find us on patreon.com slash gate seven international, patreon.com gate seven international. So please do um uh, please do join us there. I did say that Olympiacos are the only team I know in the world right now that would that will score five goals and will still make their fans feel puzzled, troubled, frustrated, and confused. Uh Indeed, it was a very big, uh, big win today. Uh, all things considered, uh, after some very, very turbulent weeks, what not with Diego Martinez being uh, being sacked, the sixth manager in the last 16 uh, months to be sacked, uh, all the craziness going on with Epo, with the Super League, with the government, uh, uh, fans not being able, uh, fans uh, being disallowed from entering uh, the stadiums in Greece until February the 12th if I remember correctly. It was crisis level at Olympiacos, and everybody knew that Olympiacos couldn't afford another setback in being eliminated from the Europa League uh, against Batska Topola. And not only did Olympiacos need to avoid uh, defeat, they also needed to win. And not only did they need to win, they needed to win big, to bring back some smiles, bring back some confidence, and also set the tone for the new era, another new era in the last 16 months under the new manager, Carlos Carvalhal. Uh, my esteemed co-host, uh, Aris Bulubasis, uh, did say better than anyone else that um, the match against Batskatopola, the result against Batskatopola 
would set the tone for the rest of the season and the rest of Carlos Carvalhal's stint at Olympiacos. So big win, a great first half that saw Olympiacos uh, winning 3-0, getting a 3-0 lead, uh, a goal by Ayub El Kabi, which I would like you to tell me, I would like you to tell me in the comment section, if that goal, if Ayub El Kabi scored that goal in Greece, would that goal stand or would VAR start putting... So start drawing some lines there. Do let me know. And then, of course, Daniel Podense, you guys. Daniel Podense, a, a, a fantastic brace in just two minutes. Daniel Podense, who was dealing with injury and, well, a lack of form in the last few weeks. But he proved to be, well, I'm a bit ahead of myself, but arguably the man of the match tonight. A 3-0 lead for Olympiacos. A great start. Not great football. Not the... Not the kind of fluid uh, football, the kind of fluid, the kind of football we liked, the kind of football we remember from Pedro Martins, Ernesto Valverde, Mitchell's first stint, Marco Silva, but it was uh, substantial and it had substance to it. But then the second half came came, came along. Olympiacos scored that fourth goal with uh, an incredible uh, cross by Costas Fortunis. Three assists the night for Costas Fortunis. Found Panos Rezos, who got an amazing header. Uh, unfortunately, though, that goal does not stand as Panos Rezzo says. This goes down for as an own goal by Veliko Ilitz, the Batska goalkeeper. That was on the 46th minute. Olympiacos were cruising for a huge victory at Karaiskaki. But then they conceded a ridiculous goal, another ridiculous goal from a defensive mistake, this time from uh, Francisco Ortega, who tried to act like Diego Maradona in the opposing box. That is our box. Uh, tried to flick the ball, and that led to Ifet Djakovac's goal on the 48th minute, which brought back a lot of stress, thinking surely Olympiacos cannot screw this up, or at least, you know, go from cruising to a big victory to just managing to win 4-3 or even getting a 4-4 draw. Uh, and then Alexander Tsirkovic's uh, goal just shortly after Nikola Kuvelic's uh, red card in the 60th minute, just a few seconds later, just... You saw Tsirkovic just taking the ball and running like, like it was nothing, like it was suddenly like he was a sixth grader playing with a bunch of third graders and just took the ball and ran and just scored the easiest goal of his life. That brought back some, uh, that started to bring some some clouds at Karaiskaki thinking, okay, here's the moment where we screw up just like we did with Martinez. But then no, it was none other than, a, than Youssef El Arabi coming from the bench and scoring a close-range finish on the 67th minute to make it uh, 5-2 for Olympiacos. Uh, a strange result for Olympiacos, this one. Uh, on paper, this looks like a triumph. But on the other hand, some, some serious problems are, are still being exposed at Olympiacos, namely defense. Did we mention in this podcast that Olympiacos need to sign a centre-back and that should be the priority? Well... If we haven't, I do it now, myself. Uh, we're hearing about Costinia coming from uh, Rio Ave uh, in the uh, summer, though. Uh, a right back, quite highly rated. We're hearing about him coming. It's not official at all. Hopefully, we're not going to see another little uh, drama of him maybe going to another team. Like, I don't know, Nottingham Forest, maybe. I'm not too sure. Uh, let's go through the uh, comments. Um here we have Alex. I liked our team pressing today. Masuras was great at that today. Yes, a great a great match from Yorgos Masuras. Uh, we've heard reports that uh, Masuras is uh, very highly is highly rated by Carvalhal. He sees a lot in that player to help him with his pressing, helping him with his systems. Of course, Olympiacos today were in a mostly a four four two kind of formation. They started the game, which is a very Carlos Carvalhal. Type of get type of formation that we've seen in previous uh, teams. We've seen him also adopting the five four one. We've seen him adopting the um, the three four three formation. Uh, it's early days. I mean, what uh, Carlos Carvalhal only could have done in this game is just use everything that works for Libiacos and try and figure out all the things that don't work for Libiacos. Well, I could say that he did a lot in the first regard. He managed to get the most out of Olympiacos' strengths. But when it comes to the weaknesses, we saw 
Very little, in my opinion. Please do let me know what you think in the comment section. Uh, I'm genuinely, this is from Nikos R. I'm genuinely sad as an Olympiakos fan that Ike and Pau didn't go through. We need them to pull their weight in Europe for the coefficient. Well, you know, I, I do agree with you in that regard, which is why I'm happy that Pau made it through. Uh, but from then on, like, there are some things we need to address. It's never easy to address those issues with Greek football. I mean, uh, Greek football is not the Premier League, you guys. Uh, it's not the kind of thing where you think to yourself, where you think that you can't blame the referees. It's uh, when I was, I'll tell you this, uh, when I was in England um, and I was much younger, I was uh, that was around 10 years ago when I mentioned the referees, the English would give me this look of contempt. Like, really? You blame the referees? Well, the Greek Super League is not the Premier League, you guys. Unfortunately, there is... Um, there is a lot of corruption in that regard. Uh, fixed matches are not something strange for the Greek uh, for the Greek football fan. And this season, well, it already starts to stink. And it's a shame that uh, we haven't had this uh, podcast for a very long time because you would know I never talk like that. I never talk about fixed matches. I never talk about the referees. But uh, after that Volos game, and uh, the fact that uh, the Greek government decided that there will be no fans present in any football stadium until the 12th of February, and the fact that uh, and the fact that um, the uh, Greek government allowed fans to go to Tuba and Leoforos, but didn't allow them to come to Karaiskaki, that makes one think that um, there is a bit of a there is about a bit, bit, bit of preferential treatment there. We'll see, I guess. But personally, guys, I'm going to say that I am not too confident about winning the title, and I think we're going to see a lot of uh, weird stuff in the uh, upcoming Greek Cup clashes with Panathinaikos, uh, especially in Leoforos. We're going to see some weird uh, VAR lines being uh, put together. Let's see some more comments. Um, let's try GS here. There was a great comment during the Galatasaray versus Man United game by the commentator. Galatasaray is a team that embraces the chaos. I think we need to do the same thing. Things could be a lot worse. Well, I do feel like in a way, Olympiakos and every Greek team have learned to do this in one way or another, which this is more like um, embracing the toxicity mostly, but Kostas Levoyani said it better than anyone else uh, on Twitter and on our Patreon WhatsApp group that uh, out of any Greek team, Olympiakos are the likeliest to benefit from the lack of fans at the stadium. Now you're going to tell me, Kostas, what are you talking about, Olympiakos? I mean, the fans at Karaiskaite are always the 12th player, and they are, they always are. But the thing is that with a new manager and all that pressure that's built up, all the problems that the team has, the fact that there's going to be all that, the fact that things are going to be so calm in the in the upcoming matches, both at home and away, could help Olympiacos um, uh, adapt to this situation. Um, it could help Olympiacos make a smooth transition uh, to help them figure out their problems, their mistakes, and the January transfer additions. Uh, it's one thing when you have a bunch of angry Olympiacos fans uh, letting you know that you'll be sacked in the morning the next um, the next day just because you're not playing very attractive football. It's a completely different story when, yeah, indeed, you're not playing very attractive football, but you're managing to get the result. And at the end of the day, guys, I mean, the whole thing is going to be um, – the whole thing is going to be decided in the playoffs again this season. And by that time, Olympiacos might be able to have figured out some uh, of, the, uh, of the bigger problems – might be able to have created some important harmony within the team. And that is where you hit your opponents, I guess. Uh, let's go. GS is very busy tonight with us. Thank you for joining us, man. Rodine in the first half was fire. Well, Rodine, I, I dare say he's fire pretty much in every game that we have. Rodine is having a bad game down the right. Olympiacos do struggle. He did miss Fortunis down that right flank, I feel. Uh, he needed to have more of him on that right flank because... The chemistry between them is uh, just something else. Um, 
We got another comment from Stefanos Dries. Thank you for joining us there, pal. Ike will win it again this year. Well, you know, I can't really disagree with you on this one. Like, I do really, I, I do really wish I could say that Olympiacos are going to win it, but the fact as well that um, UEFA have refused to bring uh, foreign referees this season to, uh, to for the Greek Super League and Greek Cup matches. We're going to have Greek referees there. So I'm not too confident, guys. I've seen a lot throughout the years. I've been following the Greek League since 1999. And I've seen a lot of things there uh, in that regard. Um, I'm not confident. Uh, if anything, uh, I think the next two Greek Cup matches, um, the next two Greek Cup matches against, pa against Panathinaikos will show us uh how pessimistic we should be how suspicious we should be of uh epo in the greek super league but, but i'm not good I, 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 I'm, I'm not optimistic you guys like i think you should be prepared for everything that's all uh that's all i'm gonna say about that christos has joined us here thank you for joining us man well uh i hope you were here for the uh moment silence um, this year, Pauk and this pool are shed together from Maris Galamatis. Well, I don't think Pauk are winning it either, to be honest. I think it's going to be a, quite a two-horse race between Panathinaikos and Nike. If anything, right now, now, they're, now that they're out of Europe, that's going to give them more time to concentrate on the Greek league. And that was Ike and Panathinaikos' strength last season because they had no European football. They just had the chance to concentrate on everything, uh, uh, on everything Greece. And that helped them come very close to the title uh what else did we have today well the big the big surprise tonight was omar richards coming out coming in for the last few uh minutes of the match omar richards playing his se first senior match in almost two years actually he's never he hasn't played a senior game for nottingham forest he played for the b team against the Ahoras, if i remember correctly we didn't see much from him but it's good to see him back on the it's good to see him in, on the team Although I'm not holding my breath because that's just a Nottingham Forest low knee that's trying to regain full fitness and uh, return bigger and better than ever to Forest next season. Uh, he's very highly rated over there at, um, uh, at the city ground. I don't expect him bringing anything extra to Olympia because he's not an Olympiacos player, really. What I'm really looking forward to is Doron Leibner's return from injury. There's a player you can look at. There's a player you can... Uh, you can see contributing to the team, a hungry player, a young player, very highly rated, very talented, um, some very good reviews uh, from Israel for the Israel International. Uh, truly hope we can see a lot more from him heading to next season. Uh, GS here with a comment. I don't know if it was tactical, but our vector of attack seemed to switch from Rodine right side in the first half. Ortega left side in the second tactic or coincidence. I think I, I think Carlos Carvalhal is still figuring things out. It's a real shame he didn't have that match against Panzeraikos. It, it was obviously postponed due to the uh the referee striking. And I do agree with the referee strike because uh the attack the, the threats at Papa Petru and the uh the attacks on the uh uh on the referee's uh store in Peristeri that was absolutely unacceptable. Fan violence is unacceptable, no matter how you look at it, folks. But uh, just to finish that argument, uh, Carlos Carvalhal is basically right now he's putting band-aids everywhere. Uh, he's still figuring things out. There was some the way Olympiacos played, though. We, thought, we did see a lot more confidence, uh, especially when you looked at Podense and uh, Rodine doing those back heel flicks, uh, especially in the first half after those three goals. Uh, it's a real shame Olympiacos didn't have their fans tonight because the boost that they would get, the atmosphere that would have been created. Uh, and you look at those two goals Olympiacos conceded. Um, I'm very, I'm very worried about the second goal where you know that Batskatopola player had all this space and time just to do whatever he wanted. Like I said, he looked like a sixth grader playing with a bunch of third graders. But when it comes to the second goal, to the first goal, excuse me. I seriously doubt Ortega would do this if the if the game was nil nil. If the match if if the game was nil nil or if Olympiacos were one nil or two nil ahead, I don't think he would have done that. It was very silly. Uh, I and I do hope he uh, learned a thing or two. And I hope Carvalhal did explain to him how important it is not to do it again. Uh, 
Labros Silva said it really well here. He predicted it really well that uh, those defenders are really going to be quite a drag until January. Olympiacos really need to bring a center back in January. Uh, I got to say, though, when it comes to Carlos Carvalhal, it's early days. Of course, he's been through a lot of teams, but the things I'm reading about him, the things I've been told about Carlos Carvalhal is that uh, a lot of the teams he worked at, he was very loved. Uh, still, at the, uh, he did a great job at Delta Vigo. Um, fun fact, he did invest in youth over there. He brought in one Gabri Vega, who was uh, eyed by pretty much every big Premier League club in the summer. And he ended up in, uh, where, where was it, Saudi Arabia? I think it was Saudi Arabia. Massive boo right there. And he still very much loved I mean, Filoski, Filoski, Filoski Tromilidis was, uh, I guess, that uh, Vasily Sabrakos' podcast. And um, Phil has worked with, uh, with Carvalhal when Carvalhal was uh, an analyst on La Liga TV. And Carvalhal told Phil that um, he, uh, when he was at Vigo, after he left Vigo, he went to a gas station and he and the guy and the and the petrol was on the house. They didn't allow. They didn't let him pay. And at Sheffield uh, Sheffield Wednesday as well. Like I said on, in his uh, in his uh, debut season, he made it to the. Uh, he was in the cha- that was in the championship. He made it to the uh, championship playoff final, uh, only losing to Hull. And then the next season, he took them again to the playoff. Uh, to the to the play to the to the championship playoffs eliminated by Huddersfield in the semifinals on penalties. And when it comes to Swansea, you guys, like, he he really improved Swansea over there, you guys. Big wins over Arsenal, big win over Liverpool. Uh, that was the year where Liverpool made it to the uh, Champions League final and lost at Real Madrid. And uh, in the first leg, Swansea lost 5-0 at Anfield, uh, whereas at the Liberty Stadium, uh, Carvalhal beat Liverpool. And he amassed around 20 points in the uh, second half of the season. I think he had less than the second half of that season in the Premier League. Uh, if he had the first season and he got another 20 from the first half, then he could have finished 14th, 13th, 12th, along those lines, and he would have avoided relegation. It's big ifs, but this manager knows what he's doing. Like, and he does have a reputation of, st- of uh, steadying the ship. Uh, doesn't matter how problematic the ship is. Doesn't matter if it's sinking, which Olympiacos are not sinking, though, to be honest. Uh, so, guys, do tell me on the comment section, what do you think of Carlos Carvalhal so far? I mean, he is he is experienced. He is talented. Of course, he has never dealt with um, a task as big as this, I dare say. Now, you, you're going to tell me now, come on, Costa, the guy worked in the Premier League, the guy worked in La Liga, but... The thing is that the pressure at Olympiacos is quite unique because uh, he's still expected to win the double. He's still expected to do well in Europe. Uh, so, and he's going to have to do it without fans. He's going to do it during a very to- uh, amid a very toxic environment with uh, all those uh, club owners at each other's throats, especially against Olympiacos. Um, uh, and the transition period to boot as well. But like I said, even if Olympiacos get eliminated from Panathinaikos, the lack of fans in the stadium could help Carvalhal continue his work, even Pedro Alves continue his work, because those two are going to be working closely together, along with Jose Ignacio Navarro, uh, who is, of course, uh, Antonio Cordon's uh, right-hand man. I do want to say, though, you guys, uh, I said in the last podcast, anyone who's not, who wasn't around for uh, the one last week with uh, Aris Bulubasis, um, of course, we didn't like the fact that Antonio Cordon was removed as sporting director, especially mid-season, and especially after all this uh, big talk of him, you know, turning Olympiacos into a uh, uh, into a top club again about cooking about, about him, you know, let him cook and everything. Well, we've heard a lot all of the reports about Antonio Cordon dealing with some personal problems, with him demanding to spend a lot of time in Spain, and those reports are not unfounded. We can confirm that they're true. Uh, and basically, after digging a little further, I can tell you that Pedro Alves's appointment was not at all illogical. And also, don't forget, this guy is talented. He took Estoril and turned them into a decent Primera Liga side. He turned them, he did the, this out of nothing, baby, you guys. He did it out of nothing. 
So now Olympiacos are in the Europa Conference League. Uh, fun fact, uh, this is... Um, this is uh, the, the, the this this whole thing means that Olympiacos have made it through to the knockout stages of a major European competition for the 14th time in their last 16 attempts. I repeat, Olympiacos are in the knockout stages of a major major European competition in the 14th time out of the last 16 attempts. And that's on a Greek Super League budget, you guys. That's a Greek Super League budget, not a Saudi Arabian one, not from Qatar, not from Dubai. It's a Greek Super League budget. So let's have a look at Olympiakos' uh, probable opponents in the uh, Europa Conference League playoffs before the last 16, reminding you that Pauk went straight to the last 16, very rightly so, uh, fair and square after topping their own group. So who could Olympiakos face in the... Um, in the uh, Europa Conference League uh, playoffs. Those teams are, of course, Slovan Bratislava, Ghent, Dinamo Zagreb, Bode Glimt, Legia Warsaw, Ferenc Varos, Eidracht Frankfurt, and, of course, Ludogorets. I repeat, it is Slovan Bratislava, Ghent, Dinamo Zagreb, Bode Glimt, Legia Warsaw, Ferenc Varos, Eidracht Frankfurt, and of course, Ludo Goretz. Do tell, do let me know in the comments section which one you prefer. Personally, I don't think there's a clear winner in this. Um, Alex is uh, wants to uh, settle old scores with Maccabi Haifa, who of course Olympiakos cannot face because uh, Maccabi Haifa are going to um, are going to have to face a different. They're in the same pot as Olympiakos. But if they make it through, then Olympiakos could face them in the last 16. But Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but Alex, Alex 050, well, you want to sell some old scores? Here's a, here's one, here's a few for size. How about uh, Ludo Goretz? Remember how they eliminated us from the Champions League a couple of years ago? Or how about Eidracht Frankfurt, who to whom we finished second behind them in the year where they made it to the final and won uh, the Europa League against West Ham? Here's a couple of uh, scores to settle. But guys, I gotta say, Olympiacos have no score to settle whatsoever until they figure a few things out. One of the few things they need to figure out is the fact that I still find Olympiacos are heavily reliant on Costas Fortunis. Uh, three assists tonight. Uh, it would have been a different game if he wasn't uh, on the pitch tonight. Uh, let me check though, guys, just very quickly because I wanna make sure it was only three assists tonight. Uh, no, I think it was four actually. So let's. He, he created a lot of these assists. He created. Uh, he he technically created uh, Panos Retsos's goal. He created Podence's goal. He created both of Podence's goals. Well, technically four assists tonight. So three and a half assists. Well, imagine if Costas Fortunis again wasn't in the uh, wasn't on the pitch. Uh, Marcial Debo, our fellow co-host, uh, big shout out there as well. He did say on the Patreon WhatsApp, did I mention you need to sign up on, on Patreon? Well, do it now. He did mention that uh, the score line uh, will say a lot as to uh, uh, as to how Carvalhal is approaching Olympiacos. He said it's one thing if Olympiacos would have won 2 0 with two goals by Costas Fortunis, it would have been different if Olympiacos won 2 0 with goals by from Pepiel and Ola Solbakken, two players that we didn't see uh, much from under Diego Martinez and they didn't get a lot of opportunities at the same time. Well, my dear Marcial, tonight uh, Costas Fortunis didn't score a single goal. Uh, we saw two goals from Daniel Potenza, which is huge because he was dealing with injuries, he was dealing with fitness issues, and it seems like he is probably coming back uh, for us. Uh, we had a very uh, beautiful goal from Panos Retsos, who, in my opinion, very unfairly was very unfairly um, deprived of that goal because it was a wonderful, wonderful header. A returning goal from El Arabi, first goal since when was the last time he scored for Olympiacos in the Europa League? I think it was against Freiburg uh, in Germany, if I remember correctly. Uh, and of course, Ayub El Kabi back in goals. Uh, well, he also had a goal disallowed. Again, it was that was a close one uh, once more. 
that goal would have definitely not been disallowed at Volos and Greece in general. Uh, but then again, four assists, basically. Three assists, three and a half, three plus one, call it what you want, three assists again. Olympiakos need to find a way not to be real, so reliant on Costas Fortunis, who's already 30 years old. He has had two very big injuries. Uh, I feel like Olympiakos need to find a way to um, get more out of Pepiel and Ola Solbaken. I was so glad to see Pepiel coming on the pitch. He really needed a goal. It was such a shame he didn't get it. I do feel like uh, Carlos Carvalhal has two ultra talented players right there, like uh, real gems right there that could push him at least for a title challenge this season. Uh, I mean, we've seen what Ola Solbakin can do at uh, Bode Glint uh, two seasons ago, was that? Where, uh, yeah, it was two seasons ago where he practically took them by the hand and uh, led them to, what was it, the semifinals of the conference. They were one of the main reasons why Bode Glint, that team that no one knew about, including yours truly, one of the reasons they made it this far was Ola Solbakin. And that is why Jose Mourinho signed him at Roma, which... Admittedly, his run there was not impressive, which is why he was sent out on loan uh, pretty easily uh, last summer. But still, guys, talent is talent right there. I feel like Yoros Masuras can really help. Uh, uh, the kind of influence that he has at Olympiacos and the Greece national team. I mean, remember, I mean, Masuras has scored pretty much all of Greece's uh, crucial goals uh, during the uh, Nations League and the, uh, the Euro 2024 qualifying campaign and if Olympiaco, if, if Greece make it through to the Euro 2024 finals, which they highly likely will, I feel like Masuras will still be a big player for them. Uh, lovely comment here from Stefanos Dries. My man, thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, for being here with us. Seriously, if you're watching this at 2.20 a.m. EET, then it means you will love the Patreon. The WhatsApp group is worth it alone. I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Stefane. We, because uh, not only that, you guys. I mean, Stefane, do confirm if do, do tell me if I'm saying lies. Not too long ago, I did share an exclusive story on Patreon, which I'm not allowed to, uh, which I could never actually share in public. So, do join our Patreon, and we're also going to be giving you all the all the uh, scoops that we can that they could never see the light of day. So do join us. They're all the exclusive content for Olympiacos, all the latest gossip, uh, some amazing banter from all of us there, from all the co-hosts, Labros Irmos, everyone's favorite uh, host, let's face it, Labros Irmos, Gate 7 International Superstar. Uh, he's the star of the show. Then you've got Aris Bulubas, he's uh, the godfather of the show, the heart and soul of the show, who's bringing you all the stats, all the, um, all the deep dives before they even come out. Uh, and then you get even more uh, uh, insights from Aris and his deep dives in our Patreon group. You got Marcial De Bo, you got Dimitris Quincidis, and you got Costas Levoyans, and of course you got moi in there. So guys, you're not giving me any um, any prefer any preferences on the Europa Conference League draw there. Who do you want to face? I will repeat the names right there. Actually, let's go through them. I mean, you got Slovan Bratislava, Olympiakos have great. Uh, tradition against them. Yeah, bring them on. Slovan Bratislava, absolutely stunning tradition against them. Ghent, we've never faced them. Uh, if we do face them, we're facing uh, a well-known figure in there, in Ugo Kaupers. Man, Olympiakos really screwed the, po the pooch on this one right there. I mean, you're going to tell me right now, did Olympiakos really miss uh, Ugo Kaupers? Because on one hand, they have Youssef El Arabi uh, killing it up front uh, by becoming uh, the Greek uh, the Super League top scorer for two or three, se two, th two seasons in a row. And then you had Cedric Bakambu, who was also last season's uh, top scorer. But, you know, a, a, a Youssef El Arabi's time has come. Uh, he's going to run his contract till June, and then uh, he is going to leave the club. Cedric Bakambu left the, the way he left. He wanted extra money. Olympiacos were offering him a very good, um, a very lucrative deal. Uh, but he opted for Qatar, for Al Nasser in Qatar. That didn't work out for him. So he crawled to Galatasaray, where he makes less than what Olympiacos were offering him last summer. Fun fact right there. And now you look at Hugo Kauperes, who ever since joining Ghent, 
he has registered a staggering 50 goals and 15 assists in 83 matches across all competitions. You guys, the guy has contributed 65 goals in 83 matches. And he's only 26 years old and a Belgium international. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the money Olympiacos could have made out of this player? Well, we might have to find out if Olympiacos draw Ghent. Well, yeah, GS, you're absolutely right. Well, Markovic as well. He still plays for Partizan Belgrade, right? Uh, the reason I didn't mention him is because he's not among the uh, the uh, potential opponents. But let's talk about Zvetozar Markovic. Absolutely, yeah. How about that, Pooch? Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right there, uh, GS. Well, the thing about Markovic right there is that if Olympiakos had him, they would have had a much stronger defense. I'm going to say this as well, you guys. You're probably not going to like it, but... If Olympiacos still had Costas Manolas, they would have a stronger defense. I mean, imagine this. Imagine a defense right now consisted of Panos Retsos, Zvetozar Markovic. That would be the uh, center-back duo, by the way. Costas Manolas, the experienced, the veteran. Uh, Jackson Porozo. And if those Nottingham Forest people insisted, why not Julian Biancon? Much, much, can you imagine how stronger our defense would have been? How many of those ridiculous mistakes would we, would we be seeing at the back? Freire, that Freire thing with uh, Freiburg never happened. That doy crap with uh, with Panathinaikos, with uh, Batskatopola would have never happened. How much stronger Olympiakos would have been there if Olympiakos had kept Markovic? Well... Here's another thing, you guys. Olympiacos need to start showing um, showing faith in talent. Like, we need to see more of Ivan Brinitz. Like I said, Carvalhal trusts the youth. Carvalhal was the one that brought Gabri Vega to Celta Vigo's senior team. We'll do the same with Gabri, with Ivan Brinitz. Is it Ivan, his first name, by the way? Nevertheless, Brinitz. Bring him in and put him in the European list in the second round. Add him to the European list. And we need to start, start seeing B-team players coming through, you guys. We need to see Bagallanis coming through, considering how crap our defense is. The guy's 22. If he's still not good enough to go to the Greek to the, uh, to the senior team, then you might as well sack him. What are you paying him for? He's 22, and he's playing with a bunch of 16-year-olds, for Christ's sake. Let's, let's see more from Sabudzis. Olympiakos will need more in midfield, especially when they play Ike. They, they're going to play Ike at least another three times in the league. If they make it past Panathinaikos, they could face them in the cup again. And we know how overwhelming Ike are in midfield with that diamond formation. I mean, Brighton underestimated that. And look what happened to them. They lost at home and they almost lost at Hagia Sophia. They should be, they're very thankful that I couldn't finish, uh, couldn't finish an opportunity, couldn't, uh, that, I, that I couldn't finish uh, if, if they paid them to, which they technically are. But anyways, I'm trying to make a joke. And it is... Half past 2 a.m. in Greece. So I am trying and I just came off a very, very busy eight-hour shift with the sun. Uh, let's see here from Stefanos. Uh, Ugo Kauper showed how dedicated he was by essentially sitting out a whole season to join us and also learning Greek in record time. Absolutely amazing guy. Well, there you go, Stefane. You're echoing everything I just said, and I couldn't agree with you more, my friend. Yes, do you think Socrates would have been useful this year? Well, Socrates, first of all, Socrates is a lovely guy. I have had the uh, honor of interviewing him and meeting him. Uh, and he's a lovely guy. He loves Olympiacos. He loves Greek football. He loves Greece. I do feel like his influence at the back would have been important. And I still think that Papastathopoulos, I still feel Papastathopoulos was always a good player. And I feel like this season as well, like, as an addition, like Avram Papadopoulos was at his latter years, he he would have been useful at Olympia because, yes, um, I would have preferred Costas Manolas. Um, I do hope Socrates, if he's listening to this, doesn't take this the wrong way. But I feel like Costas Manolas, if he hadn't gone to this Raja team, which, you know, his contract is running out, he still has some good years left in him. I mean, Manolas was a, was, was a revelation. We saw it at Roma, how important he was for the team. Uh he was one of the major reasons why Roma made it to the uh, semifinals of the Champions League when he eliminated Ernesto Valverde's Barcelona with that amazing header. 
Uh, that was the reason why he was signed at Napoli, which admittedly his influ he wasn't as that influential there, that um, that impressive there. But like it's Sharjah, actually the team is called Sharjah, not Raja. Um, personally, you guys, and do tell me on the comment section. In the comment section, Manolas' deal runs out with uh, Sharjah soon. I take him back. I take Manolas back. Do let me know uh, what you think. Uh, Stefanos, another comment here. Uh, isn't it Martin's fault we got rid of Kalpris and Markovic? He was so cold. Yes, basically, yeah. He wouldn't give them an opportunity, even though it was so obvious that Kalpris was our best uh, striker after uh, El Arabi, or at least in terms of longevity, he was our best striker. And in terms of, of selling power, he was much better than El Arabi and Coutinho at that time. He didn't see it. And Markovic as well, he was our best defender based then such a sale value there for Markovic as well. I mean, he would have been, he would have gotten a, such a good price right there. And yeah, I mean, there you go. Alex agrees with me. We can blame Martins for Calpers. We are on 40 minutes, you guys here. If you haven't done so already, please do like and subscribe. This really helps uh, the algorithm. This really helps us uh, share uh, the word. I'm going to tell you guys, uh, I've met Olympiacos fans from every corner of the world every continent bar antarctica of course uh if we do have somebody from antarctica watching us right now well thank you for joining us uh but it's it always amazes me when i go to karaiskai and i meet americans i meet canadians i meet australians i meet people from new zealand i mean uh, they make this long trip they they they, they 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 travel for 24 hours plus to come and see olivia cost play and it always moves me guys do share, do like, do subscribe. Uh, let's share the word, guys. Um, let's see, we have another comment here from Alex. Again, Manolas was world class, but he was a bad locker room influence. I don't agree he was a bad locker room influence. Uh, the reason he left was because of Mitchell. He had a... Uh, things turned sour with Mitchell during... Uh, the Spanish manager's uh, first stint with Olympiacos, and uh, things were already difficult at the team in this overinflated squad, already going to their uh, third manager of the season already, and it was only summer. And when Mitzel arrived, Manola said, you know, F that, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Uh, so, yeah, basically, guys, uh, No, that was from Achilleas, by the way, not Alex. Sorry, Achillea. Thanks you. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, do we have anything else to um, to add here? Uh, we had a big, uh, big, uh, another good game from Pascal. Like his big save that kept Olympiacos uh, alive. Another thing that worries me, I have to say, is the midfield. Santiago has started so strong uh, as a number six, but the more the season goes, the more the season progresses. The more it sounds, the more it starts to look like he's not a pure number six. He's more of a number eight, because there's still quite, there's still there, there, there's there's still a big gap between midfield and defense, and that's one of the reasons why Batska scored that second goal. It was that um, yeah, the locker room was bad in general last year. GS, that's right. So we can't just blame Manolas. Olibiakos, what do who do Olibiakos need to sign in the January transfer window? Let's let's think. I mean, obviously, the January transfer window is there for tweaks. You can't build a team mid-season. You can only make tweaks. Um, uh, you can only make tweaks right now. But which are the tweaks that Olympiacos will need to make? Center back. Absolutely. That's non-negotiable. you got to bring a bloody good center back into the team. I don't care how much, it's, how much this player is going to cost. I don't know. Look at Brazil as well because... Some players are going to be out of contract in January from Brazil. Have a look there. Obviously, nobody in Europe wants to sell their uh, their best players, especially for uh, a friendly price. So Pedro Alves, uh, Jose Ignacio Navarro, and Carlos Carvalhal will have to scout the shit out of this one. Um, Alex here says uh, we need two CBs and one midfielder. That's interesting. Uh, though, question for Alex, how would you feel if Olivia Cosbrot Bagallanis from the from the B squad and signed 
a really good center back. I think that would cover us. I think we need another center back to come in. And when we say, when you say midfielder, which position, number six or number eight, surely we don't need another number 10, especially if Pepiel doesn't leave in January. Uh, Ari, uh, playing with three eights was one of Martinez's big mis biggest mistake when he tried to lock the midfield with 4-3-3. I think you're on to something there, Ari. Uh, you think so? GS, one CB and one central defensive midfielder. Yeah, yeah, that could work. I have to say, though, lads, uh, one problem we're facing right now is uh, with a number nine position. And that is because... I cannot imagine a Yubel Kambi not being called up for the Africa Cup of Nations to represent Morocco. So that means he's going to be gone uh, from early January until early February. Uh, Stefan Jovetic hasn't really convinced uh, up front. Uh, is it maybe time? Uh, I'm just going to come out and say it. Uh, is it time to bring on Al Gassimba? I think it is. And I think he deserves opportunities. So many impressive performances for the B team. Maybe even bring DB Keita. I mean, yes, yeah, he, he did deal with um, he did deal with a major injury hell, but he came back and he scored a brace on his return match. Keep an eye on him. I mean, Carlos Carvalho likes to work with young talent, so why not bring in Algasimba and DB Keita? Olympiacos need a boost in the wings as well. So bring on Brinitz, bring on DB Keita, try them out. Try Algasimba. Ayubel Kabi will be missing for a month. Stefan Jovetic, though, I do have to say, guys, the guy is very, very talismanic for the Montenegro uh, national team. Uh, in his last four games, he's got like almost four goals and like another two assists for them in the last two international games. So there is a way for, for, um, for Jovetic to get the goals for your team. Just need to figure out that way that works for him. Uh, Achilleas wants Samaseku to come back. Well, I'd love that too. Obviously, that would be only via loan because I think he's got like a 15 million pound uh, release clause uh, slapped in him. Well, and I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening. I would love to have Samaseku back, probably even play him as a starter in the midfield consisted of Eze, Madikamara, and Samaseku. That would have been amazing, in my opinion. Aris Galamats with another comment. Bagalianis and moving Doi to the midfield as a six would be wise moves as backups. Yeah. I've never seen Doi play as a number six. I never saw him at the B team playing that role. Didn't see him in that in those uh, summer preseason uh, matches as well. I mean, might as well. He's just he's just not good enough as a centre back. Unfortunately, he had a few good matches last season with uh, next to Socrates Papastathopoulos, but I don't see him as a I don't see him uh, continuing as a as a centre back myself. Like uh, I would just go with a number six as well. Alex, we got an answer here. I'm fine with Bagallanis. I was talking about a defensive midfielder. Ibora is only good when we want to protect our lead. Well, yeah, I think we should have seen him at the Batska today. Just you know, when, when it was getting a little stressful after those two goals, thinking you know when those clouds were coming back and you, we were thinking about that Batska Topola game, you know, away where Olbiakos just gave away a two nil lead and almost lost actually. I hope Carvalhal is like Paulo Bento and brings three, four young players from our academy and give them some experience. Um, yeah. You know what, guys? I don't disagree at all with that. Paulo Bento was a very, um, very mediocre manager, but the fact that he was the only one who had the balls to bring uh, Panos Rezos, uh, Man Yanis Mantha, uh, to bring wrong Panos Rezos, Odysseus Andruzzo, uh, Odysseus Andruzzo, Jesus Christ, uh, Thanasis Andruzzos and Manthatis, that just spoke volumes of his uh, of his uh, mentality and his trust in youth. Biel is a false nine. Oh yes, yes, GS, yes, GS. Biel is a false nine. My God, we've said it so many times here. You're never going to hear it from the Greek media. Bet Biel killed it at Copenhagen as either a number ten or a false nine. Costas Fortunis has to be our number ten. You guys, uh, he's our most influential player. And Pepiel brings the goals. But at the same time, you know, Yubel Kabi is coming back to goals. The thing is, he's more, more of a squad player. And he's more of a right place, right time kind of player. So he does need those balls from uh, Costas Fortunis, especially. He does need those balls from um, Daniel Podens, even Yoros Masuras. So, yeah, but, but uh, Pepiel is the kind of player who can get the ball 
uh, and make a, and make the kind of movement that leads to the goal. He can take the ball, put some dribbles together, and score. He's more of a an entertaining number nine who also gets the job done. That is if he regains his uh, form from last season. Aris Galamad says, for the winter transfer, bring in players only if there is a good probability to lead and stay in their position. CBN 6. I don't think we need another forward and no more wingers. We have more needed. Yeah, I agree with that. Bring on Brinitz, bring on al Gasimba, bring on DB Keita. Why not? Achilles Besha Maseko had only played one minute for Hoffenheim this season and they won 15 mil. He's worth max three or four million. Well, they do rate him very highly there, pal. Um... I do not know if Bento coaches the South Korean team. I'm sorry there, the GS. Biel Fortunis as the two of the 4-4-2, those two up front. Well, I don't disagree with you, but then again, I guess you want Masuras on the right. Uh, and then again, you know, El Kabi is our top scorer, so it is quite a risk getting him out of the uh, getting him out of the starting lineup there because he does get the goals for us. Or more like a 4-4-1-1. Yeah, that could also work as well. Absolutely right. Uh, Saudi Arabian national team. No, that's Paolo Mancini is the uh, Saudi Arabian national team manager. What's your opinion, Alexandropoulos? Hope we keep him. We need Greek players. We do need Greek players, but uh, I find Alexandropoulos to be quite inconsistent. He was amazing against West Ham, and I was thinking the same thing. You know, we'll sign him up, you know, right now. I'd much rather if we signed up Daniel Podence. We need his influence. We need his runs. We need his... The way he cuts into the opposing uh, into the opposing uh, uh, box from the uh, from the wings from the sides, um, I find him quite inconsistent. I still need to see more of him. I he has struggled to create a um, a um, uh, a bond in the middle with uh, with uh, Madika Mara and Santiago Eze. Madika Mara as well has been quite inconsistent. So this brings the this brings the question as to whether or not Olympiacos need a number eight. Well, maybe Santiago Eze could be the number eight and Olympiacos could bring in a number six. Well, to, to answer your question, I want to see more of him. I want him to get more opportunities. Yes, we need more Greek players, but like I said, guys, B team. A lot of talent there. Muzakitis, Sabuzis, the Costulas brothers, Magallanis, Zolakis. A lot of talent there. Uh, we need to be resourceful with our limited options. Can't believe I'm saying that after all the transfer. Biel is a false nine. Makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love to see Pep Biel uh, getting his opportunities as a false nine. And I do believe that if he does get the investment that he deserves, he's going to start piling up the goals again. United Arab Emirates coach. That's what Paulo uh, Bento is as well. So we're, clo we're close to an hour here, guys. Um, if you haven't done so already, please do like and subscribe. Um, so let's go to man of the match and coaches. Great, obviously, man of the match. Well, no, it's not obvious, actually, because, well, no, I'm not going to go with Daniel Podence. I'm going to go with Costas Fortunis again. Well, uh, against the curve right there, because Fortunis had practically four assists. He didn't score a single goal, but then again, you know, it's the Costas Fortunis effect. Absolutely influential. Without him, um, without, without him, it would have been a much different game. Four assists. Daniel Podence had those two goals, but he wasn't as um, dominant and as impressive in the second half, which is when Olympiacos uh, started to tumble. And we started to think that, you know, with a 4-2, uh, even with a 4-2 uh, lead, we were, we were fearing we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna flop and we're going to bottle it. And, you know, we didn't think we were going to lose, but we were afraid of a shock draw there that would have made um, that would have restored uh, a sense, a very a sense of negativity and uh, and uh, and bitchiness and whinging, uh, but I feel like it was Costas Fortunis again when they, with his influence and managed to uh, to restore confidence, to restore tranquility. So I think I'm going to go with Costas Fortunis as man of the match. When it comes to coaches, great. Who Carlos Carvalhal? I'll give him a B, not a B plus, not a, not an A, not in the A area because those two goals worry me. Because, but, because uh, the difference in quality between Olympiacos and Batska Topola was very evident. And Olympiacos are still not a good team. If it was Freiburg, if it was West Ham, it would have been, it would have been a wash. This game, I'm afraid, uh, we would have been much, we were much worse than we were against West Ham at Karaiskaki, and we were 
I think just just a bit better than we were at Freiburg. And uh, I'm looking at all those opponents in the Europa Conference League, and if we continue playing like this with those childish defensive mistakes, that inconsistency in midfield, and all this reliance on Costas Fortunis, I'm afraid that uh, we cannot beat slash eliminate any of those potential opponents we could get to the Europa Conference League. So I feel like he has a lot of work to do. But then again, though, with despite the crisis, despite all the nonsense going on in the um, in the Greek Super League, the EPO, the Greek, uh, all the, the fans being banned, the uh, fan violence, all of that, he managed to maintain his composure, fielded a decent side, not only got the job done, not only won, but he also scored five goals in his maiden appearances. But still, problems in defense, problems in midfield. I'm giving him a B for this. Do let me know in the comments section what you think. Um, Rodine, for me, is man of the match, says GS. Aris Galamatis disagrees with me. He says Podence locked the game and finished 90 minutes. Uh, first time, I think, yeah. Uh, Couch gets a pass. He did not do anything crazy, but nothing spectacular. Couch? Couch? Coach. Coach. He means coach. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Man of the match, we have an agreement here with Alex for Fortuny. So, guys, well, we're approaching an hour, and I think that's going to be all for tonight, you guys. If you haven't done so already, please do like and subscribe. It really helps with the uh, core, with the uh, algorithm. I've said it so many times. Jesus Christ, I need some sleep. Thank you so much for joining me, you guys, at this late hour, especially for those watching from Greece. Um, we always appreciate all the support. Uh, do join us on Patreon if you haven't done so already. Um, this was a big a big win for Olympiacos, you guys. I really hope the players and the manager enjoy this. Like, I would love them to party right now. I actually want them to enjoy this. Give themselves a pat on the back because they deserve it. They do. They bloody deserve this one. To enjoy this after all the crisis, after all the drama with Martinez, with Epo, with the Super League, with the government, with the fan violence. They deserve to enjoy this. And you know what? Carlos Carvalhal, he is a good manager. It's glad that the confidence has returned at Olympiacos to an extent at least. But then again, you're only as good as your next match. And uh, Olympiacos are facing uh, a long road ahead. It's going to be bumpy. It's going to be difficult. Now that Olympiacos are in Europe and two of their main rivals are not, that gives them a disadvantage amid all their uh, issues. Next game is on Monday, this Monday against Panceraikos away in Ceres. Difficult game against Pablo Garcia, who's going to be very much up for it. He's put together a decent side. Hates Olympiacos. Then Atromitos on Thursday, away again. And then a long, long break until January 3. That break's going to give a long, a lot of time for Carvalhal to have a mini preseason. That could be a major difference maker for Olympiacos. And then back on January 3 against La Mia away. Uh, anything else to add on this one? Biel would definitely party tonight, <laughs> says Achilles Beos. So, I mean, we're fans, we're Biacos fans, you guys. What, what options? What, what options do we have? other than support the team and support the process. Let's just do that, you guys. Let's just do that, you guys. And let's see how that goes. So, guys, thank you for joining us. This was KT7 International for the fans, by the fans. I'm Kostas Llanos. I was your host for tonight. Um, for the 100th time, thank you for joining us. And I am going to see you next time. Got the ball.